This is the Fat Loss Pro Podcast. Fat Loss Pro Podcast. Discover what's needed to burn, build, and shape the body you want. You'll walk away knowing what you need to do to create results now. Chris DeFay is the authority on fat loss and getting you in shape. Getting you in shape. Cutting edge, results-based info from the world's best that unveils the curtain to quicker, simpler, no-nonsense fat burning, muscle building, and quality health. Welcome to the Fat Loss Pro Podcast. I am the Fat Loss Pro, Chris Dufay, and today I have another rip snorter of an episode for you where I sit down and talk with Lane Norton. Now, I'm sure a lot of people listening right now know who Lane Norton is, as I'm a big fan as well, but also if you don't, no dramas, I give him time to give his own spiel on who he is. A lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about today is kind of the moderation side. It's going to be teaching you how much protein you should be eating, when you should be eating it, what fiber, how much fiber you should be eating. A lot of the time, people are going to excess. They're going to the big swing of the pendulum all the way on one side or all the way on the other side. Now, this is about getting you in great shape, but also about keeping you in great shape as well. Before I hit play on this really good episode, I want you to head on over to www.chrisdufay.com where I've got all the show notes for you. This is where you're going to be able to pick up the links and the breakdown of everything that's in this episode, plus the diets and workouts and the whole shebang that's sitting there waiting for you for free as well. If you can head on over to iTunes as well and hit subscribe, but also leave me a review. I actually want to hear your feedback. I want to know what you want from this podcast, what you don't like, and everything in between. If I can make this better for you and help you get in better shape, improve your health, and feel better, I know I'm doing a better job, and that's what I'm taking this time out for you with. Now, before I hit play, I want one more thing from you. I want you to be able to take notes and be able to apply everything that we're giving as well. It's pointless for you just listening us ramble on and giving out thoughts and beliefs, but you're not actually using it at the end of the day. The biggest reason I wanted to get Lane on today was because I've had a couple of clients, especially one that was struggling with certain ways of how to eat. And it wasn't until I actually was able to help guide her through how to actually take control of what she eats and not being too, or let me say, anal on certain things as well. Unfortunately, too many people are willing to sacrifice their health and really their mental well-being and being so strict that it's not going to work long term and it's proven to this. One reason why I wanted to get Lane on is so he could also share his thoughts as I know he's a big believer of this as well. Now, let me hit play and let's get into this episode. Lane Norton, thank you very much, mate, for coming on to the Fat Loss Pro Podcast. I really appreciate you taking uh, the time out for me and the listener as well, because I know currently we're on opposite time zones, so it's morning for me and it's the end of the day for you. So thanks very much for taking your time out, mate. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure. So a couple of the reasons why I really wanted to get you on is I really respect the standings um, and beliefs that you have with everything, and obviously you're able to back everything up and on from an anecdotal and evidence point of view. And I really want to make sure that we can push that across to the listener as well. And if not really, we can't really force them into changing their minds, but obviously I'd really like to put different angles and beliefs in which they can start to think about for themselves. Yeah, well, I've always been somebody who's, well, I don't go against the grain just for the sake of going against the grain, but I think a good scientist, one of the, roles of a good scientist and um, uh, Neil Tyson Degasi, who's, uh, who has a show on, on, in America called Cosmos. He's an astrophysicist, but I remember watching a show and he said the role of any great scientist is to question even the most fundamentally held beliefs and, and to, as to why uh, something is accepted as true. And so I've just always looked at somebody and somebody will say, well, this is, this is what, what it is and this is the way it is and said, okay, why? You know, and, um, uh, that a lot of, it makes a lot of people angry sometimes, but, uh, you know, I always tell people, look, we should care more about getting the right answer than about being right. You know, I've changed my mind on, on several things, uh, through my career where I looked at the evidence, you know, after the course of years and said, Hey, I was wrong about this thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, 
So yeah, I you know I have my own biases and that sort of thing, but at the end of the day, I care more about getting the right answer than I do about being right. Do you think that ego, especially for the trainer side, the ego just gets in front of them too much and it really stops them from having a, a, a good point of view of what's going on? Oh, absolutely. Because, I mean, I've even been not guilty of that, but guilty of you know having a thought of, oh my God, God, I don't want to say that I was wrong about this because then people will think I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> it's like a, um, it's like a politician who's almost forced to help hold, you know, they might've done something wrong in the past, but they were forced to basically keep saying, no, that was the right thing. Even when everybody says, no, that was wrong. They have to say it was the right thing because otherwise people will say, well, you're a, you're a hypocrite. You're a flip flopper. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think ego is a huge thing. I th- you know, I think everybody wants to be right <laughs> about stuff they say. But uh, at the end of the day, I care enough about, you know, the information I put out there, my reputation and the clients I work with that I just care about getting the right answer for them. And if that means, I mean, I'm going to be wrong on stuff. Show me one person who is always right. It doesn't exist, you know. And uh, like when I give um, when I give uh, seminars and talks, the first thing I do is I get up and say, hey, look, this is just my opinion based on the data I've seen. I'm trying to give you my best judgment of what I think things are, but there's a good chance I'm going to be wrong about some of this stuff. I'm always going to try and get it as right as I possibly can, but I'll probably be wrong. And there's nothing wrong with that. And um, I think a lot of people don't want to admit that because, you know, they don't want, you know, they'll feel like they'll lose their clients or that sort of thing. And over the years, I found that for the most part, any client I've lost from saying, hey, you know, I don't recommend this anymore. That was wrong. Any client I've lost from that sort of thing uh, wasn't a client really worth having in the first place. And And if anything, you probably gained two back from actually saying that. Absolutely, because I think people are actually finding it refreshing now that somebody's, you know, people, somebody trying to be honest about things um, is actually, I posted something on my my Facebook fan page the other day, a a link to an ebook that I I recommended they they look at. And I said, hey, you know, full disclosure, I do get uh, a, a small percentage of the sales from this book. So, you know, I'm just letting you guys know it's a good book. I do recommend it, but I do get a portion of sales. And somebody said, wow, I really respect the fact that you know, you actually say that. Yeah. I said, well, I think, I think most people, you know, uh, appreciate that because especially in this industry, there's so many charlatans out there mm. um, that, yeah, all they're trying to do is get your money. So don't get me wrong. I like making money as much as the next person, but not enough to put it in front of my integrity. No, it's very good. And I also think obviously yourself having the PhD background, but also the coach and being able to join those two forces together do you think that current trainers today should have more of a standpoint with the point of view that you're taking with that? Well, I think it's going to be, you know, obviously I think education is a huge thing. And so, yes, I think, you know, trainers should get more educated. Um, but, you know, obviously not everybody's going to, you know, not to, this is going to sound elitist, but not everybody's going to be able to get a PhD. Yeah. I mean, even if they do work hard, right? Yeah. Um, but that being said, that doesn't mean you can't go out and still educate yourself further, um, whether it be via, you know, online classes or, or those sorts of things, you know, basic physiology classes, or even just, hey, go buy a, a physiology, physiology textbook. I had a friend of mine, Paul Ravella, who's a, who's a coach and uh, one of the people I recommend to other people. And uh, Paul actually doesn't have a science background, but he went out and bought an exercise physiology text just to start reading it, just so he'd have a better background of things. And actually, now he's uh, he's going back to school at uh, age uh, thirty eight because he wants to get his master's. He wants to get his master's in exercise science. So I think, yeah, I mean, I think I think we're guilty on both sides. I think scientists can be guilty of you know not caring at all about anecdotal evidence, and I think that people who you know kind of quote unquote the bros out there, you know, don't care enough about you know empirical evidence, and and both both. Uh, both things are wrong. Exactly. So the pendulum swings too far in both ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I've, I've, there are certain things that, you know, I've observed with enough clients that I'm pretty convinced uh, I have a good handle on that you are not going to find in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a PubMed study. Um, you know, but I tell people if I put that information out there, hey, this is just my observations with clients. I'm not saying that this is in the scientific literature. Um, and at the same time, you know, there's, 
I still think that the crux of what we do in terms of recommendation should be evidence based. You know, if uh, if you ask somebody why they why you should do something and their response is because I said so, <laughs> I probably ought to fire that person. Um, you know, if you go in to get your if you go in to get your 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 car checked because it's breaking down and the person says, "Hey, you need a new tr- new transmission," and you say, "Well, why?" and they say, "Because I said so." Uh, I think you're probably going to go to a different repairman. You know, <laughs> that's a good point. Okay, so one thing I really want to delve into and sort of more have this conversation geared towards is obviously fat loss and people being able to get lean and not necessarily stage lean, but at least going from good to great and then obviously from great to impeccable as well. So the first thing that I really want to talk about, because I see a lot of people having a lot of ums and ahs about is obviously protein requirements and how much they need to be eating, when they need to be eating it, the frequency of their meals and everything like that. I know you've got a pretty good standpoint in this. So can you just delve into the listener for what they need with this? Well, I think you have to define your terms too. So, you know, protein needs are actually pretty low in terms of need is defined as, you know, what you require to maintain nitrogen balance. Um, And so that's going to be pretty low. That's going to be about, you know, 50 to 60 grams per day. It's a pretty low number. But in terms of, you know, what's optimal to, to maximize kind of muscle mass and performance and body composition, that's going to be, you know, quite a few magnitudes higher. Um, most, of the, most of the data out there shows that, you know, pretty much all the anabolic effects of protein are, are, are capped out at about one, uh, or I'm sorry, about two grams per kilo body weight. So if you're getting two grams per kilo, you're, 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 you're probably maxing things out. Um, You know, there's now for the average person, they're probably not getting quite enough Uh, for the average bodybuilder or fitness enthusiast that most of them are getting too much. I mean, and and that being said, you know, there's nothing wrong necessarily with consuming 2.5 or three grams per kg. You know, those intakes seem to be well tolerated and basically safe. But I've seen people recommend four or five, even six grams per kilo body weight. And that's just absolutely insane. Uh, There's absolutely no evidence to suggest that that's beneficial. And, you know, while two to three grams per kilo has been shown to be safe, I mean, you start getting in, into double that and who knows, you know what I mean? So I think, uh, I think the two grams per kilo body weight is a really good number to shoot from. And people will say, well, is it, you know, per pal or per uh, kilo of body weight or per kilo of lean body weight? Uh, you know, it's a rough, it's a rough estimate. You shouldn't be looking like that as, as, as a, you know, oh, I'm a, 2.1 kilos of bot- grams per kilos of body weight or 1.9. So I'm, you know, off the optimal. No, that's not how it works. It's a continuum. So now, if, like I said, if you want to be safe, two grams per kilo, you're going to be good to go. Um, you know, if somebody said it's two grams per kilo of lean body mass, I'm not going to argue with them either. But, uh, you know, I, you know, I weigh, you know, about 94 kilos and I consume about, 100 gram, or I'm sorry, about 220 grams of protein per day. And, you know, obviously that's more than I require to maximize uh, muscle mass. But I also like eating protein. I like meat. So, um, you know, I, that, that amount's not going to hurt me and I enjoy it. So, you know, no problems. But for maybe somebody who has a little bit more problems getting that amount of protein, you know, I think a lot of times trainers make the mistake. They'll take somebody who's totally new to dieting and, 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 and or you know fitness and they'll they'll maybe be eating you know 60 grams of protein a day and all of a sudden they say well you've got to get 200 you know and you know that person it's not gonna be able to happen you know they're gonna feel like a failure because they're having so much trouble with it so you know and they don't and they don't need that much so i think that you know bringing it back to more reasonable recommendations is is probably uh probably a good idea as far as frequency you know uh i always tell people like I, I went into my PhD wanting to find an excuse to eat more protein and eat it more <laughs> frequently. And what I did when I was done with my PhD, I ate less protein and I ate it less frequently. <laughs> so, I mean, I was biased in the, in that direction and I still made changes the other way. So, I mean, I, I tell people that most people probably eat too frequently in terms of the fitness industry. Um, I think four or five meals per day is absolutely fine. And if anything, there's some evidence that eating too frequently is actually suboptimal for muscle mass. And actually, there's some evidence that eating too frequently is bad for fat loss, too. So, 
Uh, I think that, you know, you can do it too infrequently as well. I think one to two meals a day is probably not optimal for muscle mass. But, um, you know, so I think that uh, based on the data I've seen, what I've observed, I would say four to five meals per day of, of protein containing meals. I think that's completely reasonable. Yeah, completely agree. And just for the listener that kind of, I think most people that are listening right now would be um, more on the fitness industry side. So they're probably the people thinking, okay, I've got to at least shoot for six meals or up from there. What are the mechanisms behind the cons from eating too frequently? Well, I'm going to get really sciencey. Good. But it, it's, it's called the, the refractory phenomenon that we observed uh, in our studies. And basically what it means is that if you eat, if you eat amino acids, protein too frequently, you actually, um, it actually impairs the anabolic response. Uh, and so, uh, for example, there was a study done by uh, uh, a researcher named Wolf, and this was at University of Texas about a decade ago. And they basically, they infused pure amino acid solution into the people's bloodstream for six hours straight, right? Sounds, uh, I, remember, I remember 10 years ago, people were saying, oh, I wish I could just get, you know, an infusion of amino acids all day. I'd be anabolic all day, right? Have you ever heard somebody say that? So, but, well, they did that for six hours straight. What was interesting was that anabolism uh, peaked at like an hour and then came back down to baseline at two hours and never went back up again. So, you know, it was by feet. So and we observed a similar thing when we were feeding, you know, just uh, regular complete meals. So what that tells me is that maybe the system needs some time to quote unquote reset. Um, and, uh, and so, yes, I, I don't think eating eating uh, that frequently is a good idea for muscle mass. And uh, further, there was a study done by a guy named Phillips, Stu Phillips, who's one of the, who, well, he's the best researcher for protein metabolism out there right now. And um, he fed equal amounts of total protein for the day, but he either fed it in two meals, four meals, or eight meals, and found that four meals was the best in terms of maximizing muscle protein synthesis. So again, I think now that we have that data, we can at least say pretty conclusively that, you know, yes, too much training is bad, too little training is bad. You know, we tend to be extremists in the fitness industry. So, you know, something like vitamin D, you know, years ago it came out that vitamin D might be good for you. So people were eating like, you know, 10 capsules of vitamin D per day or, you know, fish oil. I heard some people say to recommend to take, you know, 30 grams of fish oil per day. And it's like, no. And there were studies that came out after that that showed that, no, you know, too high of those was actually toxic. So, you know, again, there's that this idea that, you know, there's an optimal range. So the question isn't how, you know, how much can I, you know, how much can I slam down? The question should be, you know, what's optimal? Mm. That's a good point, especially like with the fish oil. I was talking with a friend um, not that long ago and he just experimented with himself. It was quite some time ago, but taking super high doses of fish oil, then he had his blood work done. And obviously his omega-3 to omega-6 ratio was way off. His membranes were too fluid because the omega-3s were too high. Yep, and actually they, they've actually shown people who consume too, uh, too much omega-3, they have, uh, they have trouble, uh, it can actually uh, cause problems with clotting in terms of you don't clot very well. So yeah, like you said, it'll make your membrane too fluid. So, you know, people say, oh, omega-3 is good, omega-6 bad. Well, no, the, what, the, what it is is most people have too high of omega-6 to omega-3, so normalizing that is a good thing. But just slamming a bunch of omega-3, you know, getting that ratio out of order in the opposite direction is no better, you know. But unfortunately, you know, it, you know, moderation isn't sexy and it doesn't sell magazines. It doesn't point. sell magazines and it doesn't sell personal training sessions, you know? So, I mean, I like, look, I did my thesis on leucine. I'm, I'm a leucine junkie. Nobody's, I've, I think very few people have spent more time in their life studying leucine. And, you know, I recommend people, you know, if you're going to supplement with it, you know, two to three grams at a dose. And I've seen people recommend like, there's a very, very popular uh, coach out there who recommends like 20 or 30 grams in during your workout. I mean, just absolutely asinine, you know, because, you know, why am I going to listen to Lane over here? He's recommending this much. You know, that's not hardcore. <laughs> it's, it's really, 
it's quite silly, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely it is. And I think this probably segues into the good side. I've got another question I really want to um, ask along is obviously flexible dieting in um, if it fits your macros and the kind of the eating methods out there for people to really, one, live a decent life that they're not going mental with, but also being able to get into the bodies that they're happy with. What, what's your scenario? Like, how, how do you talk to someone that's kind of really struggling with getting in shape? But also, I really want you to talk about the mental side of it as well, because I think that's a big part that a lot of people just miss out. Absolutely. I mean, I used to tell people, hey, eat these foods, not these foods. And what I found over time was it doesn't work. Like, it'll, it'll work for 12 weeks or 16 weeks or whatever it is. And then when that person's done with their diet, they blow up afterwards because they have no concept of a, of a lifestyle, you know, it's just been, okay, eat chicken, broccoli and rice, you know? And, uh, and so when they go back to eating other foods, they have no concept of how to moderate that. And they, they blow up. And actually the research, the scientific research is really grim. What what they show is that, you know, we can lose weight, no problem, but 95% of people, whatever they lose, they put back on within two years. And, it's just an enormously high failure rate. And actually, of those people, uh, about a, about half of them will actually end up putting on more body fat than they started with. So they actually end up worse off than they were before they even started dieting. You see this a lot in people who yo-yo diet. And so what I'll tell people is like, look, yes, if, if you want to you know, quibble with me about is a sweet potato better than a Pop-Tart or a Tim Tam, <laughs> since we're in Australia. I appreciate uh, that. Love Tim Tams, by the way. Amazing. Um, you know, yeah, you know, obviously a sweet potato has more fiber, there's more vitamins, all this sort of stuff, but we have to get right back down to the crux of can somebody stick to just eating certain foods? Yeah. And, and, the, and the fact of the matter is if you don't give them some sort of system of, of being able to track and kind of have, you know, less restrictions, um, most people can't stick to it. And like I said, people say, well, look at this person who lost fat. Well, sure. But let me see their pictures six months after their diet's over. Yeah. Okay, now let me see that. And so what you'll see with my clients is they, they're, they're most of them who have been doing this for a while, who have been with me for a while, they stay far, far leaner in the off season from competing than most people do because when they're done, they don't feel the need to go out and have huge cheat meals and binge because they haven't deprived themselves that much. And a lot of people. Sorry, Lane. Do you also find that people obviously that stick better in the off season are also ten times better in the on season? Oh, absolutely. I always tell people because shows are one in the off season. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot of people can be you know regimented and disciplined when it comes to a twelve week diet, but you know get somebody to be disciplined in the off season, and that's you know that's huge. But I mean, I tell people like I, I want to feed them. You know, I want I want to properly reverse them out of that diet. Yeah. And I mean, I've gotten people to the point where they're, may, I mean, I've got a guy right now who's, he's literally stage lean he and he's eating over 400 grams of carbs per day. Um, but he didn't, he didn't start there. Like we, we worked him up slowly to that point, but his metabolism has responded really nicely. And that's one of the kind of benefits of reverse dieting. But um, do, do you also think that's the unsexiness coming through again, where obviously someone finishes the competition and then it's like, hey, guess yeah. what? do you know what I mean? We, it's, We're gonna, yeah, yeah, you're still working, of, baby. Yeah, instead of, oh, well, go out and have whatever you want because you're super anabolic or whatever they say. Yeah. yeah, I always find that funny. Have you heard that? People say, oh, you're super anabolic after a competition. Do you um, agree they're probably more prone to putting on body fat in that position? Absolutely. I always tell people, oh, you're anabolic, all right. Your fat cells are yeah. super anabolic. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's, I've seen, I'm sure you've seen this. People can put, I've seen people put, 10 kilos on easily in a week absolutely, and not, not just water because water doesn't stick around for a year, you know? So I, I think that's, yeah. a, that's a great point because I've just been doing some seminars around Australia and I had multiple, multiple women come to me sort of like in the private time and say, Hey, look, do you know what I mean? Like I've competed like four weeks ago and a couple of them, I was just like, you, you don't look like a fitness model, a bikini model or Figure. Oh yeah, and it's it's a sad thing because obviously they need to be guided properly. Yeah, well, I mean, it's 
You know, unfortunately, I think women fall subject to really bad coaching a little bit more than men, although men do too. But, you know, women, they just get told, all right, you shouldn't be eating anything other than tilapia and asparagus, and you should be doing two hours of cardio a day, and, you know, you should wear a squeam and all this other nonsense. And, um, you know, I, I've seen terrible, terrible, terrible stories. You know, uh, I, I work with women now who are, you know, 20, 25 kilos above where they competed at because they just got starved. And when they were done, they had, you know, they had no concept of tracking macros or anything like that. It was just, okay, you're in your off season, so go ahead, you know, and they just blew up. And uh, people will say, oh, well, that they just don't have any discipline, that sort of thing. And I mean, anybody who's ever competed, you can't describe how hungry you're going to be after a show. I mean, that's, that's very difficult. But, you know, I always tell people, one of the reasons I like flexible dieting is because you, you really want to use a system in place that requires the minimal amount of willpower to get you where you want to go. And people look at me like I'm crazy when I say that. But the reason is, and I talked to a, a friend of mine, Corey Probst, she's, a, she's doing a PhD in psychology. And she did a great presentation where she said, look, you don't get to pick where your willpower comes from, okay? So it's not like you have willpower for your job and willpower for your training and willpower for your nutrition and willpower for your marriage and willpower for your kids. It all comes from the same place. So when, when do most people have problems on diets? It's when they're stressed, right? They're moving <laughs> or they're having problems with their spouse or they're stressed at work, you know, all this sort of stuff. So what happens? They, 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 something has to give and the nutrition gives, right? And so, or people, you may get people who are totally regimented in nutrition. So what happens? They treat their spouse like crap, right? I mean, that we see this all the time. So I'll tell people I like flexible diet because it requires the minimal amount of willpower, right? Because your willpower is basically just counting and staying within your numbers. But hey, if you want a little bit of ice cream, no problem. It also takes away the, the kind of psychological effects of telling somebody that's a quote unquote bad food. Because what I see a lot is people will, um, you know, people will eat completely quote unquote clean and then they'll go out and for whatever reason, you know, they'll, they'll have a bad food. And instead of, you know, just saying, oh, well, you know, I had a little bit of ice cream or whatever, not a big deal. I'll just factor it into my macros. Um, they binge because, it, you know, it, it comes across, oh, my God, I've done this bad thing. I eat this bad food. There's a guilt associated with it. And so it's an emotional response of eating. And people don't want to talk about this, but I mean, you know, you're a coach, so I bet you can attest to, I would bet that over 50% of people in the fitness industry have some sort of eating disorder. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, trying to, trying to be, people don't want to talk about that, but it's true. And so I really, like I said, you know, people will say, well, you know, it's just irresponsible for you to say that somebody can eat ice cream and get lean. I'm like, why is that irresponsible? You know, it's, you know, it's, I always tell people flexible dieting is self-regulating because it depends on your metabolism. So right now I've got my metabolism to the point where I'm maintaining a pretty lean body weight on about 400 grams of carbs on my training days, about 80 grams of fat. So if I want to have a little bit of ice cream, can I afford to do that? Well, yes, because I can fit that into my numbers and still hit my, you know, micronutrient requirements, my fiber requirements, all that other stuff. But if I'm somebody who I'm down to the last phase of the prep and I'm under 100 grams of carbs a day and, you know, under 50 grams of fat, should I be going out and having, you know, a big bowl of ice cream? Well, no, because I can't fit it. In, I can't fit it. It's not going to fit. And it's the same concept of, okay, well, it's like economics. It's like a budget. So if I make a million dollars a year, if I take care of my mortgage and I take care of my, my payments and I take care of, you know, retirement, all those important things, can I go spend $50,000 on a new car for myself as a toy? Sure. But if I make $80,000 a year and I, you know, should I go spend fifty thousand dollars on a on a on a car if it's going to cause me to miss my mortgage payments or you know miss um, you know important stuff? Absolutely not, right? So in that way, it's self regulating. You know, if you're if you're slower metabolism and you consume less, you're you're not going to be able to have you know big you know quote unquote cheap foods. Do you think um, another real um, pro from that um, method is obviously because you just said self regulating, and if someone's just given a piece of paper to follow a hundred percent like the Bible. It's not self-regulating whatsoever, and that's where absolutely because because no matter no matter how perfect you think things are going to be in your life, they never are. And so people will get a diet that's you know meal one, meal two, meal three. Well, 
You have to be able to do that every day. You're not. Maybe for 12 weeks, maybe for 16 weeks. But, you know, like my friend uh, Sohi Lee said, she said, if you can't see the, the way you're eating, if you can't see yourself eating that way in six months or a year or two years, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to change things because the rebound will be coming Yeah. because you're, you're going to, you're going to fall off the deep end at some point and you're going to gain all that weight back. And the research data says you'll probably gain it all back and more. So, you know, people don't like hearing that, uh, but it's the truth. I think that's a really good point because something that I used to say to my clients, and this was years ago, and I definitely, I'll admit, I wasn't coming from this point of view. I was only coming from the point of view of an education standpoint from myself to my client was, well, I can get you in shape for sure, but if I see you down the road in six months' time and you've blown out, then I've effectively failed. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's, you know, I always get, one of the things that drives me nuts is I'll see these transformation pictures because um, I'm in the industry and I'll see these transformation pictures of people and I'll know that, you know, those pictures are old and currently they look like hell, you know? And it's like, okay, well, what was that transformation worth? Sure, they lost 50 pounds in 12 weeks, but they put 60 back on, you know? Are they really better off? Absolutely not, you know? It's, um, it, it has to be transient. And now I'm not saying people need to stay in contest shape year round. Absolutely not. That's not, that's not reasonable, but you know, fluctuating 40, you know, 20, 30 kilos from off season to in season. I mean, that's crazy. You know, you should be, you know, um, it should be something more maintainable. So, and people, sorry, Elaine, do you think too many people, especially in the fitness industry are willing to sacrifice their health to get in shape for a short period of time? Huh. Think about, think about what you just said. That's really funny. Are they willing to sacrifice their health to get in shape? So are they really in shape when they get there? Yeah, right? Sure. So I, I've had, I had somebody, I had a, I had a gal uh, right now. Actually, I was just talking to her five minutes ago. You know, a very pretty girl, um, you know, is about 15, 20 pounds, or I'm sorry, let's say uh, it's about 10 kilos over her stage weight and, um, you know, is uncomfortable, you know, that sort of thing. She's, she's, she really wants to diet back down. And she's like, I just want to, I just want to be in shape again. And I, I said, well, how did your gym sessions go this week? It's like, oh, well, I broke all these PRs. You know, I feel good during cardio, all this sort of stuff. I'm like, uh, and you know, she, her blood works good. Like her thyroid is normal. Her, your blood work looks good. Her blood lipids, everything looks good. I said, well, what, what makes you think you're not in shape? Just because, just because you don't have a ripped six pack. Anybody knows uh, if you're, if you're shredded, you usually feel like crap when you're shredded. So, um, do you really think you're in shape? So I think we, you know, people need to separate those two things, but yeah, absolutely. People that want to look at, um, you know, poor Mike Matarazzo, uh, who just passed recently this week, you know, Mike was the, uh, I, he's IPB pro. He was on the cover of the first flex magazine I ever picked up. I still remember that met him in person. Very nice guy, you know, passed away from uh, a heart condition and, uh, you know, a lot of people, well, if you ask them right now, hey, you're going to have all these problems in the future if you do this, uh, a lot of them will say, well, I don't care. I just want to have glory now. Well, talk to me in 20 years because I'm sure you're going to feel differently about it. Yeah, great point. And I think a lot of people just do not ask themselves that question. Yeah, I mean, I've told I've told a client before, you know, uh, that was wanting to get ready for a show and they're like, I will do anything to get ready for the show. I don't care if I have to eat nothing. Yeah. And I said, you know, uh, I understand that. And I, 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 can, I really, truly do appreciate, you know, your mindset that you're a very strong-willed person, but I'm not willing to do that to you because I know what comes afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you may think you want that now, but trust me, you don't. Mm. It's like the, the two things a coach needs is a whip and a leash. And a lot of the time you need the leash to pull them back uh, to control. Uh, I, I, I tell people 95% of my job is saving people from themselves um, because most people will overdo it as opposed to underdo it. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I just, the population, now that may, may not be true for the general population client, but for competitors, I mean, they're just, you know, they're so hardcore. Uh, they're willing to do because I, I know I've been I've been there before too. I've I've sat down and said I don't give a shit. I'll eat nothing if I get shredded, you know. And um, you know I, I think that it's okay to have that fighting spirit. And just from a practical standpoint, I want them to get lean too because I I want my clients to look good. It makes me look good, right? So, but I also know that. If I do extreme, if I do something extreme to somebody right now, they're going to look like crap in six months, right? So I'd rather take a longer time, go slower, um, have them get in shape the right way, and then they get to keep it. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. It's unfortunately it's that longer term vision that's needed. 
Yeah, I mean, people, I mean, what do you, I mean, what am I battling against? Again, you know, uh, uh, the, the guruism of, of uh, the fitness industry of, yes, I can get you uh, 20 inch arms in 16 weeks, just follow my six easy steps, uh, or I can shred, you know, 20 pounds of body fat off of you in, in six weeks, you know, with my shred program. Whereas I'm over here saying, no, 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 we really need to go slow. And then when you're done, we really need to add calories back in slowly to take care of your metabolism. Also, and people say, so how long is it going to take me? Oh, I think it'll probably take, you know, six to 12 months. So people go, and you know, I'm, I'm very expensive. So people will look at that and they'll go, no, no, thank you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Which unfortunately is exactly what they need anyway. Yeah, I mean, I always tell people I lose a lot of client, a lot of potential clients because I tell them I don't tell them what they want to hear. I tell them what they they need to hear, yeah. and uh, some people don't don't like that. It's unfortunate, right? And I'll, I'll I'll tell them too. I say, look, the easiest thing the easiest thing in the world for me to be, to do would to be to take your money and tell you what you want to hear, but I'm not I'm not willing to do that. Well, exactly, because at the end of the day, it's, it's only going to hurt your business because absolutely, it's no joke. Exactly. Good. Exactly. At, at some point, you can use a credit card a bunch of times, but at some point, the balance is due. Yeah, that's very good. All right. So back with the flexible dieting side, I just got a couple more things I want to cover with this. Is obviously some people just take the absolute piss out of it, and obviously are thinking they can just be smoking tin tams twenty four seven because it kind of necessarily fits in numbers. How do you guide those people, and, and how do you actually educate them to sell, tell them what's going on? Well, I think the biggest thing is just, you know, teaching moderation. Say, hey, you know, if you want a few Tim Tams, that's fine. You know, most people, unless they're, you know, crazy fast metabolism, aren't going to be able to put, you know, eight Tim Tams into their diet per day. But, you know, if somebody does have a crazy fast metabolism, I say, hey, good for you. You know, you're eating 600 grams of carbs a day. You're eating 4,500 calories. You probably need to eat a few Tim Tams just so you don't feel bloated all the time from the volume of food you're eating. But yeah, it's more, you know, it's about teaching moderation, about saying, hey, we need to hit this. Like, okay, you can have some Tim Tams, you can have some ice cream or whatever it is, but you need to make sure you're hitting your protein, carb, and fat intake, and you need to make sure you're getting enough fiber, okay? And, you know, if you do that, then you can you can play a little bit, but it's got to, we got to take care of the important stuff first, right? And uh, if we don't take care of that important stuff, it's not going to work. You know, I had a gal, I had a gal that she was on Instagram and she was like, oh, Flexible dieting didn't work for me. And we got down to it and she was doing exactly what you were saying. She was just eating junk, essentially. I'm like, you missed the entire point of flexible dieting. It's not eat whatever you want. It's eat whatever, what it's eat with no restrictions within the framework of what fits your target macronutrients. That's a lot different than whatever the hell you want. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I just think it's a, it's a good point. It's something that I really want to now home for everyone because obviously... It's just people just take the piss with this and it's it's unfortunate because a lot of people get led down the wrong path thinking, oh, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna take this point of view and they're just completely not knowing how to do it. Yeah, it's, it's just ex another example of extremism. Extremism is sexy, you know, and that's that's how it is. I mean, I've even been guilty of it. You know, I posted a picture of me uh, the the week before, or the day before uh, IPF Raw, Raw Nationals for the USA, the National Powerlifting Championship with my abs real shredded and said, hey, just wait in and eat ice cream every day getting ready for this, you know? And people were like, oh my God, you know? And it was, you know, but that was more me trying to, you know, take a take a few little jabs at people who always talk about wrong with that. <laughs> Yeah, but, um, you know, I didn't eat just ice cream. Uh, you know, I obviously still ate, you know, chicken and lean beef and all this other stuff that everybody considers clean foods. But, you know, I allowed myself to have fun. And that's why when I was done, um, I didn't blow up afterwards. I'm still about within two pounds of that, two, three pounds of that weight, you know, because I had no, I didn't have any need to go on a big cheat that, that night because I had restricted myself from different foods. Just what you said before with the clean foods, I think you brought up a good point. Do you think the biggest problem with clean foods is the not having an actual definition for this? Oh yeah. I'll tell people all the time. Like, so what is your objective definition of that? Because if you ask a vegetarian, they'll tell you clean means it, it's no meat. Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, somebody in paleo, they'll say it's anything that's you no know, paleo. Um, if it's a bodybuilder, you know, you know, sir, then it can be really hairy because it's like sometimes fruit is clean, but sometimes it's not clean because that sugar. Dairy could be clean, but then sometimes it's not clean because some people say it makes you hold mucus or some other nonsense. Yeah, so there's just all kinds of, you know, stuff. So there's no, my, that's my problem is there's no objective definition of clean eating. 
And then, you know, people want to compare. I, I posted a, a, a meme the other day that I made up of, uh, I don't know, have you, seen the, have you seen the Dark Knight? Yeah. Okay, so you've seen the Joker memes where he says, do this and no one bats an eye, but do that and everyone loses their mind. Yeah. Have you seen this? Okay, so I said, I said, fit cho- or binge on chocolate and no one bats an eye, but fit it into your macros and everyone loses their freaking minds. Which... <laughs> It's true. Think about what you see on Instagram and social media. People going, oh, I had a huge cheat meal. I had this chocolate. Everybody's kind of like, oh, yeah, cool. I love my cheat meals. And like, oh, my stomach's sore, et cetera, et cetera. But somebody says, I just made this, you know, chocolate cake and fit it into my macros. And people go, oh, you're lazy, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, really? Who's the lazy one? You know, somebody actually calculated up the nutrients in that and fit it in versus one person who just went ballistic. You know, it's uh, – so it's pretty funny to see that. It was, it was a, a little while ago. I actually made something very similar. I was because I was the exact of what your thinking was having a couple of jabs at people, and I did one, and it was um, it was just a piece of fruit in the background. I was saying, "Stop being scared of fruit. It's the gluten free brownie that's making you fat." <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, I always love the the paleo people. You know, the, the all the all the paleo friendly foods. You know. That, uh, you know, because gluten-free brownies existed in paleo times, you know. <laughs> Unfortunately true. All right, well, that's good for there. So one thing I want to go on to is like, like nutrient timing. So how do you optimize the nutrient timing for fat loss? Where do you put it? How do you use it? Well, I think nutrient timing is largely overblown. Uh, there, was a, there was a study that, or a review of the literature that came out by Brad Schoenfeld and Alan Argon. And basically what they showed was that nutrient timing has very minimal effect on body composition. In fact, you really can't say it has any. Now, I'm not really ready to say that it, there's no benefit to nutrient timing whatsoever, but I think you have to look at it in context. I think the overriding factor of body composition outcomes from diet is going to be hitting your macronutrient intake on a daily basis. Now within that, if you want to, you know, making sure you're getting enough frequency on your protein dosing, you know, four to five dosings of protein per day. And then uh, I'll tell people, I'll just tell people what I do. As far as carbs goes, uh, I put carbs around my activity. So if I'm going to go in the gym and I'm going to train hard around, you know, sometime at night, I'm going to have, you know, a greater percentage of my carbohydrate, daily carbohydrate intake at night. Um, if I'm doing it in the morning, I'm going to have a greater percentage in the morning. Um, but it's never, it's never like, oh, I'm going to have 50% of my carbs pre-workout and 50% post-workout. I just saw something the other day where somebody was saying, oh, well, you, any carbs you eat pre and post-workout aren't stored as body fat. I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's complete nonsense. You know, so, but I'll, you know, I'll maybe do, you know, anywhere from 20 to, you know, anywhere from 25 to 35% of my daily carb intake pre and post-workout. And then I'll kind of distribute the rest of them kind of however I like. Um, Cause I, I kind of look at that from the perspective of, all right, you know, if I'm going to do something that's glucose, um, you know, dependent and uh, you know, then that's where I'm going to put those carbohydrates, but it's not because I think that, you know, I'm going to magically get a 50% better performance or anything like that. You know, any performance gain or compositional gain you're going to get is going to be pretty marginal. And as far as meal frequency goes from a fat loss perspective, it really doesn't seem to make a difference. My, my colleague, uh, Dr. Bill Campbell at University of South Florida, he did a nice uh, presentation on meal frequency. And uh, we really we really can't make any claims that uh, eating more frequently causes more body fat loss. So uh, I think it boils down to, again, kind of a lifestyle thing, like what kind of meal frequency fits your lifestyle. And, you know, if you're looking at optimizing muscle mass, then make, making sure you're getting, you know, four to five protein dosings a day. But other than that, you know, whatever kind of fits your lifestyle is probably going to be best. Yeah. Do you, also with that, do you also find that people underdo or really just completely forget about fiber and its benefits, such as like it's thermogenic for one? And yeah, I think I think I think it's both ends. So I think some people that get you know you know trying to fit as much ice cream in their diet as they can, they don't get enough fiber, and that can negatively impact them. But I think that also some people overdo fiber, and if you overdo fiber, it can have negative negative consequences as well. I had um, so for example, I had somebody who was eating a really good amount of calories per day in the off season, and they came to me and they said, Lane, please don't add any more calories. I can't take any more. I'm I'm gassy all the time. I feel like crap. I'm sluggish, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, I said, well, what are you eating? And it turns out their only carb sources were broccoli, brown rice, and oatmeal. Mm -hmm. And they were getting about 100 grams of fiber per day. And I said, all right, do me a favor. Cut that down to 60 
And they're like, well, how do I do that? I'm like, I don't know, eat some pop tarts or, you know, something lower fiber, you know, um, you know, still get it 60. And, you know, so they come down to 60 and, uh, three days later he came back and said, Oh my God, I feel so much better. I can't believe how much better I feel. And, um, yeah, so it's just like anything, you know, you can, too little is bad and too much can be bad. Absolutely. In fact, um, I have some people who are very sensitive to fiber. I have a gal who, if we take her fiber much over 30 grams per day, she gets very, very bloated. So a lot of times I'll tell people, hey, if you're having problems with, you know, irregular bowel movements and um, constant bloating, check your fiber intake. You may be eating too much. A lot of people think, oh, well, if I constipate, I should just eat more fiber. But if you eat more fiber and don't increase your fluid intake, you it actually can make you more constipated. So like I said... Too little bad and too much is bad. Yeah, no, very good point. Um, so really, at the end of the day, what we're looking for is trying to add some fiber. What if I could try and make some Tim Tams that had fiber in it, mate? Would that be something? Uh, I say let's uh, market those in the USA and sell a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last one, mate, because I really appreciate the time you're giving me. Um, reverse dieting. I think this is something that a lot of people are really confused about. One, they probably just don't even know it exists, and two, how to do it. Right. So the, the, this concept of reverse dieting, it's basically the same. So it takes you 12, 16, 20 weeks to get into shape, right? So your recovery is probably going to take about that long. But when you finish a diet, your metabolism is very, very slow comparatively to when you started. And the easy way to test that is take what your maintenance calories were in the off season. And when you finish your diet, try eating those and you'll probably gain body fat relatively quickly. And so when you diet down, your body responds by lowering your metabolic rate to kind of try and prevent you from starving yourself essentially because dieting is nothing more than controlled starvation. The idea of reverse dieting is you just very slowly add calories back in. And the idea is to minimize body fat regain while restoring your metabolic rate and restoring your hormones back to normal. But if it took you, you know, 16, 20 weeks to diet down, it may take you 20 weeks to reverse diet and get back up to a normal intake. So our, you know, the whole goal would be, for example, maybe let's take your normal case of somebody who drops 15 kilos on a diet, right? And when they're done, they just go back to eating whatever. And they put that 15 kilos back on over in, in three months, right? So it's, it's already back on. Whereas, because they just go back to eating what they did before. Whereas, uh, let's take a person who we slowly reverse them you know, take their calories back up over time. And after six months, maybe they're back up, maybe, or four to six months, they're back up to their original off-season calorie intake, but maybe they only gained five kilos or less, right? So we have a, a greater net benefit. Does that make sense? Because their, their metabolism is back to where it was in terms of what they're maintaining on, but they've, they've kept more of their fat loss. Um, and so, you know, Sohi Lee, my, my assistant and now my, my co-host on Physique Science Radio, she, she did a great job putting together a 20,000 plus word ebook on, uh, on yes, shameless plug, uh, on reverse dieting that kind of tried to take a lot of the confusion out of it because it is a relatively new concept and it's a relatively new concept for me that we've only been, I've only been doing for a few years now, but for people who can adhere to it and who do it typically works pretty well and not everybody responds the same to it. You know, I tell people like, look, some people like my client in Denmark, Rasmus, who is the guy I was talking about, who's eating 400 grams of carbs now and has striated glutes. Like he, re he reverse dieted and he got actually leaner while he did it <laughs> by adding calories slowly, but not everybody responds that way. You know, some people still add body fat, but the point is they added less body fat while still getting back up to that original intake than they would have if they just said, screw it right after their diet was over and went back to eating whatever, like right back to normal. So it's kind of like a recovery from a diet, if that makes sense, a slow and controlled recovery. And uh, so our goal is to minimize body fat regain and restore your metabolism. And so you get to keep more of the, of the work you did essentially. It's kind of like, I just had the thought, it's kind of like travel insurance. You can't afford to go traveling without travel insurance where because you know something's going to go wrong and it's kind of like dieting so if you diet you're not willing to go through that it's pretty much not worth it well like i said the the i got into this because i started looking at the data for body fat regain and it's extremely grim i mean the, the research data is really grim it basically says um don't ever put on the body fat because if you do you won't be able to lose it and keep it off 
Uh, so, it's an so that's obviously just like how coaches like yeah anyone can get you in shape once but it's obviously being able to get you in shape exactly constantly. and i see this i see this so many times especially with girls uh come to me who are just completely bombed out you know they're 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 eating 1200 calories a day or less and can't lose body fat it's crazy yeah yeah um and so they've just been, you know, crash dieted so many times that, you know, it worked the first time and maybe the second time, maybe the third time. But eventually, you know, their body becomes adapted to that and they just, you know, they can't lose body fat on normal calorie intakes anymore. And so, you know, now those people, that's the most, that's the most difficult client because now you've got to, you know, restore their metabolic rate and that's going to take a long time. And uh, like, like we said, yeah, like we said, most most coaches are going to tell them, yeah, sure, I can get you in shape in 12 weeks, no problem. Whereas I'm going to tell them, oh, it might take, you know, 12 to 18 months. And people are going to say, why the hell am I going to go with you? You know, so it, um, but I think people are starting to, but usually what happens is that like the person who goes off and, and goes, works with somebody else, they come back in 12 weeks and go, now nah, I get it. You know, I, I, because I'll tell people, I'm like, look, what you have always done has gotten you to this point, Right. So what makes you think going back down the rabbit hole is going to give you a different result, you know? And, uh, but it's, it's hard for people. It's hard for some people to hear. Like we said, there's a significant psychological aspect to this. And, um, if somebody's not comfortable with their body fat, um, you know, hearing that, Hey, we may have to reverse diet you just to get you back to normal and add calories when this person wants to lose body fat. Um, that's going to be a hard battle, you know? And I get coaches who email me all the time for guidance and say, Hey, how do I deal with this, with this person who wants to drop body fat, but you know, they're completely, you know, their metabolism is completely screwed. What do, what do I do? And I said, well, it's going to be tough to convince them, you know, cause I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lane, I really appreciate you taking the time out, mate. You've really divulged with plenty of great information. I know the listener is going to be absolutely frothing on. Um, just before I do let you go, I'd really love you to be able to give a spiel on how people are going to learn more about yourself, get in contact with you about coaching, and also be able to get their hands on um, the reverse dieting book that you mentioned before. Sure. So the best way to, to keep in touch with me is through my website, uh, biolane.com. Uh, we have a newsletter that we, we send out, we don't spam, okay? We only send out when we've got decent stuff to send out. Um, so biolane.com, uh, my Twitter handle is at biolane. My Facebook is facebook.com slash Lane Norton. Uh, Instagram handle is biolane. So you can keep up with me on all social media and uh, YouTube channel. I do a lot of videos and video logs and training summaries and that's uh, youtube.com slash biolane. And then for So He's ebook that's coming out, uh, obviously I'll post about that on my site and you can also uh, keep updated on her site, which is sohefit.com, S-O-H-E-E fit.com. And then also our new podcast. Hopefully you don't mind me name dropping it on you. No, absolutely. I'm a big fan. I've listened to them all. So please do. So I want to put all these links that you're mentioning right now are going to be in the show notes. Really appreciate it. Yeah. So our podcast is called Physique Science Radio. It's really, we're, we're having different experts on every month. You know, we're talking about, you know, not just PhDs and professors and exercise and nutrition, but also people who, who walk the walk too. So all these people we have on who are professors or PhDs, you know, they also either compete or lift weights, you know, vigorously, that sort of thing. So um, we're really having on the, the, the cream of the crop in terms of experts. And um, we're just trying to get a lot of really good information out there for people because it's a, an industry filled with bullshit. <laughs> so we're trying to thin the herd. Um, and so, I'm a big fan of it. So I do highly recommend everyone goes and listens to it because you're going to get great info. Yeah, like our Facebook page, subscribe to us on iTunes and SoundCloud, and we'd really appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Chris. I really appreciate the interview. You had some great questions, man. Thank you very much, Lane. Um, I'll be in contact with you, mate, and I appreciate everything you just let go. Not a problem. Thank you. This has been another jaw-dropping podcast from the Fat Loss Pro, Chris DeFay. After subscribing to the Fat Loss Pro podcast, go to www.chrisdefay.com to get your free fat loss diet, training programs, insights, and more to burn fat fast.